All right. Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we just thank you, Lord, that we can come before the throne of grace. Uh, Lord Jesus, as I say every Sunday, Lord, I'm so thankful for that, that we can come before you and casting all our care upon you because you care for us. Because, Lord, uh, sometimes these needs are just extremely overwhelming and we don't know how to pray as we ought. But your word teaches us in, in Romans chapter eight that the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit for he the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us according to the perfect will of God. Father, we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. And we want your perfect and complete will in all these situations, Lord. We, we have our plan and you have your plan. But Lord Jesus, we know that ultimately your plan is the best plan. So we submit to you today and we put all these needs mentioned today, Lord Jesus, before your throne. And we'll just trust and, and know that you'll take care of them in the most perfect way we ask in your name. Amen. So turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and uh, we will take a look at, we, at um, a little bit yet, uh, what we looked at uh, last week. I'm sorry, I hesitate a little bit because, you know, the recorder goes dark, Al, you know, and I'm like, okay, did a couple times, you know, went off like after four minutes and I, I don't see anything. I'm like, should I touch something? Should I, I just leave it alone? So we're going to trust the Lord, okay? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's a pause there or whatever. So anyway, so First Thessalonians chapter 1. Something hit me this week, and I want to talk about it this week as I was reading over uh, from last week and meditating on the Word of God. Uh, sometimes I read the Word of God. I hope you do too when, when all of a sudden that something hits you in the Word. And I'll see something in a passage of Scripture, and all of a sudden, I'll start building a, a Bible, a, a Bible class on it. I'll get a whole message. It really happens to me when I'm on a Harley, when I'm out on a motorcycle sometime, because everything is just, I'm in the zone, and I'm riding down the highway. And I can't tell you, when I was in uh, Utah, one of my favorite places on a motorcycle, and how many messages the Lord gave me when I was in Utah. It was such a beautiful scenery, and I saw God, and, and I think of something, a Bible verse, and the Lord would take me um, a different place. And, It'd be exciting. Uh, I remember when we came in from uh, the Grand Canyon and we went up, uh, I think it's uh, 91 or 191, up towards Moab. And, and I remember, uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. We, we came from the other way. That, this trip, we came the other way through Zion and, and that way. And so we were going up to Moab and we saw this person, this lady coming in. And there was some outcroppings there, some beautiful outcroppings, and I, I love those uh, in Utah. And she was all excited, and the kids were all excited, and, and they, they got out, and they were taking pictures, and, and they were pointing at the outcroppings, and they were going, look at that, and you could see the joy on their face. And I thought to myself as I'm riding by my motorcycle, because I had just come through some super beautiful places, um, you know, and so I thought, boy, lady, you haven't seen nothing yet. And you know what the Lord spoke to me? And neither have you. And neither have you. The beautiful, this is the cursed world and the, the things that God has prepared for us. But anyway, I was reading 1 Thessalonians. I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 5 through 7 again, and I want to talk about that today, okay? So bear with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, our gospel... Uh, Paul speaking here, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, much faith and confidence, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit." So last week we looked at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, and the, we talked about how the church uh, received the word in much affliction. But it says here, but with joy the Holy Spirit. And, and that just really hit me really hard. It really hit me. I, I started meditating on that. This church uh, in the first epistle and second epistle will be very clear that they were under tremendous persecution, a very difficult time in church history. The first century church was persecuted for their uh, belief in Jesus Christ. And it really hit me how that in the midst of the suffering and persecution, how the Holy Spirit came alongside the church and, and alongside every individual believer to undergird them, to strengthen them, to encourage them, to empower them. And that produced joy. Wow. 
in the midst of their suffering, Al, they had joy? Are you kidding me? I mean, in the midst of my suffering, I get depressed. How about you? <laughs> Sometimes, right? Until I get into the word, until I get my mind right, if you will. You, you know, happiness, we, we look for, the world is looking for happiness. But happiness is far different from joy. Happiness is far different from joy. Happiness has everything to do with what is happening in our lives at that particular moment. You buy a new car, you're really happy, right? You get the first payment, you're not so happy, right? <laughs> you get the insurance and you find out it went up $500 a year, you're not so happy anymore, right? But happiness has really nothing or very little to do uh, with a joy. How quickly it fades when something goes wrong, happiness. But joy and peace are a gift from God, and they are a byproduct. They are a byproduct of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the depth of our relationship with God will determine how much joy we have. The depth of the relationship we have with the Lord will determine how deep this joy is and this peace. And Jesus tells us in John 14, 27, and you can turn if you will, if you want, or I'll just read it for you. I can quote it here. In John 14, 27, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's just about ready to go to the cross, and they're going to be you know, very disappointed in that. Uh, they didn't see that one coming. Uh, they thought Jesus would be an earthly ruler to, to kick out the Romans and so in John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace. That's a very interesting passage right there. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives peace do I give unto you. He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. Boy, if there's any verse we need today with the world coming on glued around us, with being on the precipice of World War III, I mean, literally, when you think about it, right? I mean, when our president talked about regime change and things like that, Putin's got like thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons. Now, I know that God's in control, right? And he's holding those things back. And I believe that during the tribulation, I believe there will be a nuclear exchange because some of the terminology in the book of the Revelation sounds like there was a nuclear exchange because, I mean, one third of the trees are wiped out, one third of this and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I believe he's going to hold that off until uh, the, the Lord takes us out of here, but man, we're living in a pretty dicey times, aren't we? Yes. I mean, very dicey um, with our economy and things like that. Every day I hear more and more about cryptocurrency, that the world wants a cryptocurrency. The world wants to get us off the dollar. And uh, I was uh, watching something uh, on uh, TV the other night and at the World Economic Forum or a derivative of that, uh, they had a speaker and she was talking about how they want a, a world currency so they could monitor every transaction that you and I do and to limit them those track set transactions if they feel that you are uh, not being uh, using your money wisely as as they would put it right yeah yeah Danielle yeah because if you want to do something uh, that they deem unnecessary maybe you want an SUV maybe you want a, the new Cadillac SUV or whatever you've got the money why can't you have that oh no that's not good for the environment or maybe you want to buy a car that's not an electric car we talked about those so um, they're talking about that more and more and don't you know that that's going to happen during the seven years of tribulation you know that the Antichrist is going to be able to limit commerce and the ability to for every man and woman to buy and sell but again, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. Nothing in this world, I want you to know, nothing in this world can give you this special peace from God. This is a special peace. This is, Jesus said, this is my peace. The same peace that Jesus had. Do you think Jesus had peace? Really? I mean, of course he did. He, he trusted his father completely in every situation. He had complete and total peace. Remember when they were, they were going to, uh, surrounding him and they were going to stone him and stuff like that? And kind of walks right through the, the whole crowd because what? His time was not yet. There wasn't a time. So God was in complete control and Jesus knew. You see, nothing in the world can give you this special kind of peace. And I want you to understand that nothing in this world can take this special peace away from you either. So you, the, not, the world can't give it and the world can't take it away because it is a byproduct. 
It's a byproduct of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on in John 15, verse 11, that he promises us the same joy that Jesus had, this abiding joy, this joy that will remain in us. It's a, it's a part of us. He says in John 15, verse 11, these things I have spoken to you. He's talking about his word and his promises that he's given us, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full or complete, not just joy, but full joy, complete joy. Isn't that what it tells us in John 10, 10, 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I have given you life and that more abundantly, not just life. Thank the Lord for our heart beating and we got life. But this, he's talking about the abundant life that we can have in Jesus Christ. Satan is kind of always wanting to steal and destroy, but Christ came to give us life and that more abundantly. And this joy in the midst of affliction, again, is a byproduct of what Paul was saying here in verses 5 and 6 of 1 Thessalonians, how that in much affliction with joy, the Holy Spirit, they had this joy even in the midst of affliction. You see, we don't just come to people with, uh, he, Paul didn't just come to the church of Thessalonica uh, with the uh, gospel in word only, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit's power produced joy in the midst of their suffering. He came with the word, yes, but he came with the power of the word. I believe that there was miracles and signs and wonders, as you see in the book of Acts, that follow Paul's ministry. And we don't see them much in America anymore, but I've seen many of them when I travel around the world. When you go to India and you go to some of these places that the people have no hope, right? in Africa, right? right? You know? um, so you understand that people don't have much, so they are trusting completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that I'm kind of funny when I think in word pictures, but when I think of the power of the Holy Spirit internally, um, I kind of, my mind goes to a nuclear reactor. Now, I'm obviously not a nuclear physicist, obviously, right? But, you know, what I know about uh, the pictures I've seen on TV or whatever about a nuclear reactor is that they've got these fuel rods and they're in the water, right? And as they pull these fuel rods out a little bit more and more, it produces, generates more power and heats up the water and runs the turbines and, and things like that that, you know, so if they want more power, they pull the rods out a little bit more. Anybody a Trekkie, a, uh, you know, Star Trek fan or anything like that uh, here? I've asked Susan, because, and, and uh, are you anybody? Because I, I wasn't, I'm not, but I've watched a little bit of, of Star Trek, and if I remember correctly, I'm old enough to remember when they had the original and, and uh, Captain Kirk, and uh, they had Scotty. Scotty was down in the power room, right? And so they were in the Enterprise, and, and so he would call down his, Scotty, you know, give, give us more power. I'm giving you all I got, uh, Captain, right? You know, I'm giving you all I got, because they're in some kind of thing. You see, their power was limited, wasn't it? bread. Scotty was giving him everything he had, but their power was limited. Not our Father, not our Holy Spirit, not the power of God. He says, you want power? Oh, I got power. I'm omnipotent. It means all-powerful. You need more? I got more. You want more than that? I got more than that. And you want more on top of that? Yep, keep asking. Because boy, I'll tell you what, I'll just pull those metaphoric rods out and I'll give you all the power you need in these last days. You need more joy? You need more peace? Just call out unto me. Say, Lord, I'm struggling. I don't have your peace. I don't have your joy. I'm struggling with the situation I'm in and I have so much uncertainty about the future. What's going to happen, Lord? Help me, Lord Jesus. And you know what? God understands that. He understands the genuineness of your lack of faith, if you will. He says, he's not going to rebuke you. And the Bible tells us in James chapter 1, verse 5, right? If any man lacks, lacks faith, let him ask of God, who gives unto all men liberally. And the is not, he doesn't beat you up. He doesn't put you down or anything like that. You ask for faith. You ask for uh, the Lord to help you. He will. I want you to turn with me if you want to put a bookmark in First Thessalonians. I'll put my Pastor Larry. I put my Pastor Larry in First Thessalonians over there. It was his birthday this week. And happy Heavenly Birthday, uh, Pastor Larry. It's four years. Four years Pastor Larry's been with the Lord, right? No, it was his funeral. What's that? It was his funeral. It was his funeral? Four, four years ago, his funeral. Oh, okay. You told me it was, it was passing. Why you, I ought to. <laughs> no, that's okay. Well, you're right. Let's see. It was March 22nd. Uh, no, yeah, March 22nd, 2018, uh, right on there. So anyway, he's home with the Lord. Amen, Howard? 
And you know what? He's not, he's not unhappy to be there. Amen. So turn back with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the power of the Holy Spirit today, if you, if you will. So in Acts chapter 9, we read of Paul's Damascus Road experience, and uh, it's pretty familiar to most people who are in, in, uh, in church for a while. And at that time, remember, his name was Saul, and it was changed to Paul. The word Paul in Greek means little. And uh, Saul was taken after the great uh, first king of Israel. And so we see in Acts chapter <clears throat> 9, Verses 10 through 17, we read that how the Lord sent Ananias to Paul the Apostle. Ananias is one of my favorite biblical heroes. I like him, and I, I well, I like so many, but I like him. And uh, you remember um, Saul's son, Jonathan? I like Jonathan, too. Jonathan was a good friend of David, and, and he loved David, and David loved him. And, and he actually risked his own life in front of his, his father, King Saul, Jonathan. And so here's Ananias. And I want you to put Ananias, uh, your, yourself in Ananias' shoes, because Paul the Apostle, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, you'll see, as he, remember, he goes down to Damascus Road, and he sees this bright light that literally blinds him, and he hears the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul why persecutest thou me? And, you know, he asks who this is. And, and Jesus says in some translations, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Uh, what is that? The, the pricks were this uh, tool. It was a long stick with like a type of nail or something sharp at the end of the stick. And they would use it for the oxen or whoever was pulling the plowing the field. And they would do it, Danielle, is that when the, when the oxen got off a little, off track a little bit, they would reach out there and they would hit the, the ox on its leg and it would push him back to the left or on the left leg to push him to the right to keep him straight on track. And that's what the, really the analogy is. It's hard to kick against the pricks. Well, you understand that these animals, they would kick against this, right? And how many times have we kicked against the pricks? <laughs> I know I have, but you know what? God's just doing this to try to get us back into in line with him. But anyway, we get to the point where God speaks to to Ananias. And you understand before this, Paul was breathing out threatenings uh, to all those in the church. And he had received letters from the, the hierarchy in Jerusalem to arrest anyone who claimed the name of Jesus Christ, put him in jail and even put him to death. Paul was consenting to the death of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 as he held the coats of the people. So here's Paul the apostle and everybody knew who he was. And so you put yourself in a place of Ananias here in verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias and to him the Lord said in the vision Ananias and he said here I am Lord <laughs> so the Lord said to him arise and go to the street called straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus for behold he is praying and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias not somebody else now in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, to Ananias, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, praise the Lord, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him, I will show Paul, how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And I, Ananias, went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has come to you, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. So here we see Paul the Apostle that on the road to Damascus. He has the Damascus Road experience, and we see Ananias come to him and pray for his eyesight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit for service because God was calling him um, he was commanding him and commissioning him, I should say, for service. It was this same anointing and the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that the church felt in Thessalonica when Paul was with them. This was a power of the Holy Spirit that we see in Acts 16. In Acts 16, we see that same, same power of the Holy Spirit. You see, because when, when, I, when I look at 
when I look at joy, I, I look in pictures in the Bible, and I see in Acts chapter 16, you remember Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas were called by God in a vision to go to, it was a man of Macedonia and said, come over to me. And Paul and Silas go down over to Philippi and they find this lady called Lydia and she's down by the river, right? And so uh, they talk, talk to her and, and she comes to know Christ as her Lord and Savior. And then they go on and then here's this other young girl and she's saying you know behold these men preach to you the you know the, the way of the lord the kind of thing i forgot exactly the word says but uh, after a while paul was grieved in his spirit because he heard what she was saying but something was off with this person something something wasn't right and so after a couple of days paul the apostle had discernment in his spirit by the holy spirit and he rebuked the foul spirit that was in this young lady was demon possessed and cast that demon out well, she had been used by soothsaying and fortune telling by her masters, and her masters weren't too happy, not too happy at all, because they lost all the revenue. And so they stir up all the crowds, and they get, they get Paul and Silas, and what they do, well, they beat the snot out of them, what they did. They beat the snot out of them, and they, they put them into prison. And you see in verses 23 through 25 in Acts chapter 16 that they put them, put them into the inner, inner court, if you will, and they put them in stocks. And you, can you imagine being in stocks? You know, your, your hands are out in front of you, your back is taunt after you've just been whipped severely. Many stripes, the Bible says, and how that would feel on your back. But what did they do, Paul? What did they do? They start singing. They start singing hymns and praising the Lord. What? Are you nuts? Are you crazy? This is the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. It has to be. There's no, there's no way. It doesn't make any sense in the natural that after a beating like that, that they would go into the inner in stocks and start praising and worshiping the Lord and singing hymns, right? What happens? I just, I just, I just have to believe that the father's looking at the son on the throne and looking at him and looking at each other and saying, look at our boys down there. Look at those guys. Let's go down there and shake them up a little bit. What happened, Frank? He went down there and shook those walls. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he shook those walls, and they start tumbling down, and all their chains fell off of all the prisoners. You remember that? Ladies and gentlemen, when you start praising the Lord, even in the midst of affliction, the Holy Spirit will encourage you and strengthen you and build you up and give you that joy and the peace that you just, you don't have in the natural. And you can't have in the natural, but it's only through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. And this, again, was the same anointing that Paul had, that Paul came to the church of Thessalonica with. This, the gospel is absolutely life-changing, amen? It's absolutely life-changing, and that's the first step. In fact, it tells us in 2 Thessalonians 5, 17, if any man or woman, if any man or woman be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation, right? Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. When we are born again by the Spirit of God, Praise the Lord. Everything changes. It, it seems like our whole perspective changes. Our whole outlook on life changes. But, you know, it, today it seems to me that the, the church has a tendency to, to pray for people because we want people to get saved, and absolutely we do, and then we want to get them baptized, and, and that's fantastic. That's great, too. But then after that, it seems like we, we want to almost throw them a Bible and say, good luck. <laughs> get on your way. Enjoy yourself. And don't disciple them, and don't tell them about the power of the Holy Spirit to take in the rest of the way, right? I mean, because without the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart, ladies and gentlemen, I believe with all my heart that, the, that it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can live out the life of Christ in us, especially in these final days. Ladies and gentlemen, if they needed the power of the Holy Spirit, as we're going to see in a little bit in Acts chapter 1, if they needed the power of the Holy Spirit to live out the Christian life in the first century church, because Jesus knew there was persecution coming, difficult times were coming, and they needed the power of the Holy Spirit in them. Ladies and gentlemen, we need it today. And it's, it's hard for us maybe to understand this because we live in a Western culture with, uh, with uh, you know, we're upper middle class. And, and I, although we're paying extraordinarily amount uh, for 
uh, goods and services today and things are difficult for, for many, I really feel really the worst for people on the lower end of the scale, for people those in poverty who are deciding between food and, and getting to work or whatever at a minimal paying job and things like that. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit today. I, I believe, to be honest with you, and I guess I'm going to talk about this today, I, I believe this is the missing element in the body of Christ today, the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We'll come back to the book of Acts, but I want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we've read it before many times, and you're probably familiar with this passage of Scripture. But Paul the Apostle will share with Timothy, this is his last epistle, and he'll tell him what the, it's going to be like in the last days. And it tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 5, some of the things that are going to happen, what the world is going to look at at the end of days. And I want you, as we read this, I want you to see if this parallels some of the things we're going through today. And I won't teach on every, every word. You'll, you'll get it, though. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul tells Timothy, but know this, that in the last days, that is the uh, last days, or the word there is eschatos, which is end, end things or end days, perilous times will come. The word perilous there, if you look it up in the Greek, it's a picture of a lion tearing apart its prey. It's, it's vicious times, as, as uh, other translations say. So know this, in the last days, vicious times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, oh boy, boasters and proud and blasphemers and disobedient to parents they'll be unthankful oh boy unthankful unholy unloving unforgiving slanderous without self-control they'll be brutal they'll be despisers of those that are good are we seeing that today despisers of those that are good they be traitors Headstrong, haughty, that's prideful, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Verse 5, I want to focus on here. They will have a form. The word form there in the Greek is the word we get a word shema. Shema is the word that we get a word semblance from or an outline. So they'll have a form of godliness, an outline of godliness, but they will deny its power. As you read one of, as I read one of my favorite Greek scholars, as he broke this down, uh, he was saying that this passage of scripture here, the word power, there is the same word we're going to read about in Acts 1.8, that you'll receive power, dunamos, dynamic, energizing power and ability to do something. What he says, it's the same word here for power. It says they do not deny the reality that the power is available, they deny the necessity of the power. They say we don't need it. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got all kinds of technology today, don't we? We've got bells, we've got whistles, we've got lights and cameras, and we've got all kinds of stuff. We've got our own Christian stars, if you will, and they have this preaching style. And, and you know, my, my friend that went to Bible school, he took a class, Bob Arthur took a class on preaching. Not preaching the word, but preaching stylistically. How to stand, how to inflect, how to hold your hands, how to raise your voice at certain times. <clears throat> really? I think they do that in Hollywood too, don't they? It's like acting school. I've seen people... Go ahead, Frank. Just a quick note on that. Hitler actually took uh, lessons from uh, magicians to uh, practice... The yeah, and he was an orator, was he not, Frank? I mean, he was captivating. So uh, Frank was saying Hitler took, uh, took uh, lessons from magicians and other people, you know. So, but I'm not talking about that. I've been out of the country before, and, and uh, I've seen some people that we would not even want in our churches today. But I'll tell you what, the power of God was so strong and so powerful. One of the, one of the years and years ago, I... I watch this guy on TV, <clears throat> and he had cerebral palsy. And uh, he spoke very broken as a person with cerebral palsy. But God came into his life and filled him with the Spirit of God. And he spoke very broken, and I'm not making fun when I say it like this, but he basically has said, so I have cerebral palsy, and I've been used by God. What's your excuse? And I'll tell you what, started pouring, the, the tears started pouring down my face because this guy had an anointing. When he preached, man, you could feel the power of God. 
because he humbled himself. God uses anybody, praise the Lord. So I believe it is the missing element, uh, this power of the Holy Spirit that we can have to live out this Christian life, live out this Christian life. So I want you to turn with me to John chapter 20, okay? John chapter 20. So we're going to be all over the Bible. I got to hurry up. It's already uh, like 11 o'clock. So in um, John chapter 20, and then we're going to go to, to Acts, okay? <clears throat> I believe it's a missing element. And I believe today it's a missing element in the body of Christ. And I'm sorry to say, I don't mean to beat anybody up, but I believe that's why the church is weak today. Does anybody, church, uh, anybody sense the church in these last days in America is super strong? No. I don't. I don't personally, I don't really feel that it's super strong. We've, we've lost a lot of political um, capital that we had back in the 50s. And back in the day, people were worried about the church. They were worried about the pulpits. And if you really want to go back, go all the way back to the founding fathers, all the way back to the, the before the revolution and found out they had these black robe regiments. You ever hear about the black robe regiments? Look it up sometime. The Black Robe Regiment. What these were, these were powerful preachers of God, and they would wear a black robe over their, over their army uniform. On Sunday morning, they would come in and they would preach under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and after that, they'd take that robe off and they would go out. I mean, you talk about people like George Whitfield and others that brought great revival and great sermons to America. No, I'm sorry, I, I don't see that. I see it's weak, and, uh, and, and I think we have a, a lack of boldness, and, and we do have a lack of discernment, do we not? Many Christians don't have the basic, one of the nine gifts of the Spirit is the gift of discernment. What is that? To know good and evil, right and wrong, to be able to choose what's right. We're in your spirit, right, Danielle? Go ahead. I feel people these days are always afraid to offend somebody, and they need to be more like the world, where they don't care what they say. Right, and you know, there's a balance there, right? Danielle said that uh, she feels like many Christians are afraid of offending someone. And boy, we don't want to get canceled, right? Do you think Jesus would be canceled today? Yes. He already has been. He already has been. And if you're worried about it, again, it doesn't mean that we got to be ignorant and nasty when we tell somebody the truth. But it is our responsibility to share the truth in love and kindness. And if you want to talk about offending people, give yourself a chance this week and read John, I mean, uh, Matthew 23. Matthew 23, you want to talk about offending people? You remember when the Pharisees came at Jesus, you know, and after <laughs> they're, they're, they're trying to trip him up and everything like that? You know, he, he tells them they're a brood of vipers. They're from their father, Satan. He says, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. You, you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup is, 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 is all dark. He says, you're like full of dead men's bones. He says, you, 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 you. You encompass land and seed and they make one proselyte to your way of thinking and you make them twice the son of hell you are. Jesus said that? Yep. Yep. Pretty offensive, I would say. Pretty offensive. So again, I'm sure he didn't at the bony finger pointing, but he just told them the truth. So you're right, Danielle. Yeah, you're right. So hold uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you don't, we're going to look at John chapter 20 if you're not there. Remember, this is after the resurrection. And understand the, the disciples, they're freaked out. And where did we find them? In chapter 20, verse 19. They're hiding behind closed doors. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 19. And the same day at evening, beginning the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews. Uh, I'm going to talk about that fear of the Jews. You'll see that in a second. For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad they believed, right? I mean, that's the, the point of faith and believing. They see the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So verse 20, 21, so, so Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also i am going to send you. And verse 22 says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, what? Receive, Receive the Holy Spirit, right? 
red letters, that's Jesus. So he breathed on them, he breathed on them or into them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit was absolutely essential for every believer in the church. And this is the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that every believer receives when they become a Christian. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you repent of your sins, Jesus Christ sends us the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then we also have we're going to look at uh, also an infilling or an empowering of the Holy Spirit. Every believer, when you receive Jesus Christ, I want to make sure you understand this. Every believer, when you receive Jesus as Savior, receives the indwelling, abiding, guiding Holy Spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord for that. But it looks like Jesus, at least to me, it looks to me like Jesus knew that that wasn't all the power they would need. It looks like he knew that uh, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that we all have is great, but these disciples would seem that they would need more. So I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 1. This is something that many Christians miss and uh, many denominations miss. I don't think there's a whole lot of preaching on the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be preaching, uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit after this, if I have time after this series we have about the Antichrist, and, but I'm just going to give you a little, uh, little cliff notes today. So in Acts chapter 1, we read something curious, again, that most Christians miss today. So I want to look at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> Now remember, in the upper room, not in the upper room, in the room they were at where the doors were closed, Jesus comes into them, he breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. But here we see something a little bit different. It says in Acts chapter 1, Luke is writing, and he said, The former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began uh, both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering many in, with many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, Jesus now, he commanded them. Now, this is not a suggestion. This is a military command in the Greek. This is an absolute command. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now, the promise of the Father was the Holy Spirit. Well, they just, didn't they just get breathed on and they received the Holy Spirit? What, what is he talking about here? Let's see if we can figure this out. He said, for John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They were still looking for that earthly king. And Jesus said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own authority. And Jesus goes on in verse 8 and said, But you shall receive power. That's the word dunamos. That's the same word we saw in 2 Peter, uh, 2, 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, that the, not the power was available. They denied the necessity of the power. But you shall receive power, dunamos, energizing power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you very important word, upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Wait a second. Didn't they just receive the Holy Spirit, like I said, in John chapter 20, verse 22? Yes, that's the Holy Spirit in us. But Jesus said, wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Nazarene church calls it the second blessing. Did you realize that the Nazarene church was in the original form back in the 1900s, Howard, was the Pentecostal Nazarene church? How many people know that? It was the Pentecostal Nazarene church. They were Pentecostal. And it got into the 70s, and there was some craziness going out, you know, with the, with the Pentecostal movement. And there is still today, okay? But they threw kind of, most of the churches threw the baby out with the bathwater said, well, because of the craziness, I'm not sure we're just going to separate myself from that. What has happened since then? 
we've lost a lot of power and authority and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. So this is a difference between the indwelling and the, what I call the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And this is all about service. This is all about completing the great commission that Jesus said in verse 4. He commanded them not to depart because he knew that they were going to have to go out and they would need this power of the Holy Spirit to, uh, in their lives. This infilling, this filling of the empowering of the Holy Spirit is for service. And this word baptized means to completely be covered, immersed, filled, and controlled by the Holy Spirit. When you're water baptized, some, some traditions will just give you a little sprinkling, okay? But like uh, most time, like here and other places, they do some serious dunking, don't they? I mean, you just go down and you're immersed under the water. You're just completely covered with the water. What's some, that's very symbolic, is it not, Mary? Very symbolic of being cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ in every area of your life. Uh, back in the day, I remember that uh, it was cool in, in high school to have a jeans jacket, and, and, uh, and we had a jeans jacket, and it had to be, uh, we had little bleach spots on it. It was cool. So I remember we'd tie our, our jeans jacket in knots, and, and we'd put a little water in there with a little bleach in there, and we dunk that, that jeans jacket in there and let it sit for a little while. And if you put it in there too long, if your arm fell off. The <laughs> arm of the jeans jacket fell off because the bleach, if you put too much bleach in there, you know, so you had to do it just right, you know. You had a little little uh, recipe there, but you'd pull it out and you'd undo it and you'd have little spots, you know, and that was cool. We were cool. Okay. Tie-dyed shirts, right? Same thing, right? You're the same thing. So there's areas uh, that the, the, the uh, dye didn't get to, but that's different when you're baptized. Every inch of you, every inch of you is covered. And this is the picture that you will be baptized. Yes. Uh, I remember when you baptized my yeah, I baptized my Corano in Paraguay, didn't I? Where was it? No, was it Peru? In Peru, right? And it was hot. Yes, we, I baptized, I had the privilege of baptizing Mike Corano in Peru. Yeah, yeah, it was at the Hot Springs. It was a volcanic, 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 I can't say it, Hot Springs. And Mike said, can you baptize me? I had baptized another guy in, in, in Paraguay in, in a river down there. So, And then Jerry Lau baptized me in Israel. So, uh, I mean, I got that go, right, Mary? <laughs> so, Pastor Jerry, I wanted to see his pastor card there, but uh, anyway. <laughs> He does have a pastor card. He got the pastor card, the Universal Church of Christ, uh, for $10. So that was kind of a joke he's got, but he's got the Jerry, Jerry Lau's a, a pastor. So watch out for him, okay? So this is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. This word baptize, baptism means completely covered, immersed, filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to understand that these, I want you to hear this, okay? Please don't, I don't want to lose anybody today because I know some of you come from traditions that, that never talk about the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I do forgive me. Uh, I am I come from that tradition and I do believe in the gifts of the Spirit today. I believe they're for us today and I'm going to show you in the Word of God where I believe that is uh, for us today. I believe God bless you. I believe it's a missing element. I want you to understand these were not special saints. These were not special people. Yeah, they were apostles and they were people the first century that were filled with the Holy Spirit, but they're not special people. This filling of the Holy Spirit did not make them more saved. It did not make them more holy. You will never be more saved and more holy than when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and he justifies you. You've been declared righteous by God. And that is, a, that is an, a, an act, a one-time act that has ongoing effects, Marty. It's, you're justified and you'll continue to be justified. You're considered holy in God's sight, set apart as holy. So the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not to make you more saved or to make you more holy. It is to empower you for service. It's empower you for boldness. It's empower you to do everything God has called you to do. Because some of the things God has called us to do is way beyond our ability, amen? Way beyond our ability. When we have a sickness or something, to, to, like with me when I broke my foot, to, to praise the Lord every day and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus my Lord. When the pain level's at 11, 
You know, when I'm biting my finger, literally, I'm biting my finger and I'm almost biting it to the point of being ble bleeding because I'm in so much pain that I stop and I say, hey, Jesus, I still worship you. I still give you praise. I still love you, Lord. Give me strength through this. It lasted seven long hours, but during that period of time, I praised him and I worshiped him even in the midst of my pain. Why? Because he's worthy. Because of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, I said, Lord, I need you. I need you now. I can't handle this, Lord. Please, Lord, take this away from me. And God was faithful. No, these were not special saints. And because someone is filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit, that does not make them more special. It just means that they have received this gift. It simply means that they want more empowerment. They want to be led more by the Holy Spirit. They want to be controlled by the anointing power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the call of God to reach the world. If you've ever been in, if you've been in church as long as I have, you know the difference between someone just preaching and someone preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Can anybody say amen? I mean, you know, I've heard some good preaching, and it's good exegetical preaching, which means you're properly diagnosing. You've got the three-point outline and, and everything. You've got the handout. Everything's good, and it's solid biblical preaching. And you leave there, and by the time you get to the parking lot, you forget what's said. You don't even remember anything. But boy, I tell you, you sit under an anointed preacher, and I'll tell you what, man, you sit up and take note, and by the time you're driving home, man, the car's full of the Holy Spirit. It's like, whoa, man, it was great. Man, I was in the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, I know the difference between hamburger and filet mignon. Hamburger will keep you going. Praise God for hamburger. But I'll tell you what, filet mignon, oh, every once in a while, boy, there's nothing like a good filet mignon steak. I mean, you know what I'm talking about spiritually here? Amen. Let's look at the day of Pentecost. I got to hurry. Oh my gosh, it's, it's uh, 11 something. So I might go a couple minutes over, so hang on to me. So here's the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. What happened? Let's look at verse 1 through 4. Very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, it says, When the day of Pentecost, that's 50 days after Passover, the day of Pentecost had come fully. They were all with one accord in one place. You see in verse 15 that it looks like in chapter 1, it looks like there's possibly many people believe there was over 120 people in the upper room at that time. And I always ask the same question because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, I think it's verse 6, it says that Jesus was seen by over 500 witnesses. And Paul says, Some were alive to this day. Okay, if he was seen in those 40 days that we just talked about by over 500 witnesses, Karen, uh, what happened to the other 380? Where were they at? And Jesus told them to wait, wait, and, and, and don't leave and, until you receive. The 380, did they miss out on something? Well, maybe they were working that day. I don't know, but 380, I believe, missed out on this, 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 this uh, move of God. I don't want to miss out on a move of God. So he says here in uh, verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house that they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues of, as a fire and sat on each one of them. And they were all, all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So I wonder, I know that I emphasize the word all because some say the gifts of the Spirit are just for the apostles and the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that we see all through the book of Acts depleted or died out with the apostles. Boy, I don't believe that and I thank the Lord I don't believe that. I do not believe that. It's called cessationism. It's a, you remember when the southern states seceded from the Union? They left the Union. They departed from the Union. Uh, there's a whole doctrine that believes that, uh, that when um, out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when that which is perfect has come, knowledge will go away and so will tongues and some of these other things, some of these gifts. And uh, they believe that the Holy Spirit, although the indwelling Holy Spirit is for us today, the same power we see in the book of Acts in chapter 2, that's not for us. Oh no, that's not for us. Boy, I thank the Lord that uh, it says all were filled. And again, I believe it's about 120. In fact, in verse 13, we see people started mocking, right? They started mocking and they said in verse 13, others mocking saying they, these are people who are, are full of new wine. And it, it was about nine o'clock in the morning. So Peter says, no, 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 no. These, these people are not drunk on new wine. But actually, you know, truth, when I read that, you know, Daniel, it, it probably is more accurate than, uh, than anything. Yeah, they were filled with new wine. 
the new wine or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is something completely new. They had never seen anything like this before. And so we see in the Old Testament how God came upon certain people and empowered them. You even see that before the birth of Jesus, how he, the Holy Spirit came on people and they prophesied and things. But this is a new era. No, they were not drunk, but they were filled with the new wine of the Holy Spirit that was poured out and poured into them on that day. I want to read verses 14 through 21. And he says, and it's, uh, that's read 17 for for. For sake. This is Peter talking. So Peter says in verse 16, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. I got my Joel over here, my good prophet over here, Joel. That it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be dark, uh, turned to darkness, and the, and the moon to blood before the coming of the great day and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, he, is, he is quoting Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And it's basically the day of Pentecost was a partial fulfillment of the promise that will be completely fulfilled in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 says when they will come when Jesus comes back and they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him and God will turn over and he will give them a heart of flesh he will give them a spirit of grace will pour out upon the nation of Israel here is a is an initial outpouring but there's going to be a secondary outpouring at the end it says, verse 17 tells us that this gift was not only for the Jews, but also for all flesh. And aren't you glad about that? Turn with me to chapter 10 real quickly as I hurry through this, okay? Give me a couple more minutes here. Chapter 10. Remember when, when Paul, the, I mean, sorry, Peter, the same Peter is called to the house of Cornelius. And he says in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, Acts 10, 28, he says, you know, that it's unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company with, with or go into the, another nation. But God has shown me that I should come and call, uh, I should not call on any man common or unclean. Remember, Cornelius was a Gentile, and the Jews had nothing to do with the Gentiles until God gave Peter this great vision. But what happens is Peter's preaching to Cornelius and telling them all about the Lord. And I love it when we're picking up in verse 43. And to him, and Peter's going on, and to him the prophets witness that through his name, through the name of Jesus, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And while Peter was still speaking, as if the Holy Spirit was saying, Peter, time out, time out, stop, okay? Peter kept going. He says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were, they were astonished. As many as came with Peter because what? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. Praise God. We can have it too. For they heard them speak with tongues. And what did they do? They magnified God. They magnified God. That's the same thing you see in Acts chapter 2. Remember when all those people were going around and they were listening? They were from all over the then known world, as it were. All these Jews came from all these different areas. And what did they say? We hear them speaking the wondrous works of God in our own language. Isn't that cool, Jackie? What, it, the, the, the tongues, we were freaked out about tongues. Oh my God, the tongues. Oh, what is, it, who would want us not to speak in tongues? Satan. Because we're, we're proclaiming the mighty works of God. We're, we're praising God in an unknown language, an language we've never learned. But we know that when we pray, we pray in the perfect will of God. And I'll teach you about that when we talk about the Holy Spirit in depth. But these people, they were, they were just freaked out, these Jews, that the Holy Spirit had been poured out of the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who had received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay with them a few days. Boy, all that was backwards, wasn't it, Daniel? So they got saved, filled with the Spirit, and then baptized. Wait a second, we're out of order here. We're out of order. We, we, don't, we don't do it that way at this church here, brother. Brother, you get saved. You get baptized. And then maybe, maybe if you're one of the special ones, maybe if you're real lucky, maybe you'll get filled with the Spirit. No, it's a gift from God. It's not for special people. It's for every believer. We can have it. You just have to ask for it. You say, Lord Jesus, I need this. 
I, I need what they had. I need power. I need authority. I need boldness. I surely need discernment. I need something in these last days. Amen. We can have the power of the Holy Spirit. We see this anointing, and I'm just going to talk from here real quickly, and I'll let you go. Okay, so this is off my notes, okay? So hang on, hang on. After this infilling and empowering of the Holy Spirit, we see a different Peter, do we not, in the book of Acts? A completely different Peter. Remember, he was the same Peter who denied the Lord three times. And the last one, if you read the denial of the Lord, his last denial, Mary, he pronounced a curse upon himself, anathema. He pronounced a curse upon his soul, if I even know the man. You see how complete that denial was? To deny the Lord to the point says, I pronounce a curse on my own soul if I even know the man. Oh man, no wonder when Jesus appeared to, to, to Peter, you know, Peter just, he, he couldn't even, he couldn't even put it, he couldn't even look at Jesus. But Jesus restored him, if you will. But you see, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this is a different Peter. He denied the Lord three times dramatically, but now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And you read this week if you get a chance, Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 41. And you'll see how Peter was preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This power of the Holy Spirit came upon him. And he was preaching to the point where we see in verse, uh, verse 40, 41 that 3,000 were saved on that day. And I found that very interesting because as you look it up in Exodus chapter 32, verse 28, Exodus 32, verse 28, you remember at the, calf, the, the golden calf experience when they were rebelling against God? How many people were put to death? Do you remember? 3,000. 3,000 were put to death under the law. But here is, as Mary restores it, under grace, 3,000 come back into the fold. I just thought that was interesting, right? We see the same anointing in Peter in, in the, in, with the lame man in, in Acts chapter 3, where the lame man, he looks at Peter and John as they're coming up to the temple, and he put his hand out looking for some alms, looking for something, for something, some coinage, something to help him through. He's a lame man. He's, he'd been there for all, all, the, all his life, if you will, at the temple. And remember what Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I do have... <laughs> I got something. Such as I do have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Right, Daniel? He said, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have money to give you, but I got something better than that. I've got the power of indwelling God. And I believe with all my heart, because you read the passage of Scripture, it looks like Peter's looking at him. He looked at him, and I always kind of, like this, uh, uh, you know, at the, at the landing strip at the airport, you know, the tower, you know, boop, 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 boop. you got the radar going, you know, and, and okay, I got something from the tower, okay, okay, take runway this, runway that. It's as if Peter was looking at this man, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, I want to do a miracle. Peter, I want you to lay hands on this young man. And you can hear, you can hear all the stuff going in Peter, all the doubt and all the fear, right? No, nah, it was overpowered by the power of God. And he lays his hands on this, this man and he comes, his legs take shape and he's walking. And then it says later on, as you read the passage, he's leaning, Mike, he's leaning on Peter, right? And Peter starts to preach. What a beautiful illustration. You talk about an illustration. They knew this guy. They had seen him every day when they went up to the temple. He laid there, right? And he's leaning on his shoulder. And Peter starts preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he just doesn't pull any punches. In verse 36, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You see, in chapter 4, the Peter continues to preach in verse 4-4. Uh, four, four. Acts 4-4 four, four says that after that, about 5,000 came to know the Lord. And because of this, uh, it get, you know, the, the, the healing of the lame man and others, it be, became, they became very angry. And I want you to understand that when you read this passage of Scripture, and please read it this week, because it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. He said to the leaders of Israel, these are the same leaders in verse 6 of Acts chapter 4. These are the same leaders that put Jesus to death. So put yourself in Peter's place, freaked out before, reject Jesus, deny Jesus. Jesus comes in, breathes on the Holy Spirit, 
Day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit. He's empowered. He's emboldened. He's standing before the same exact people who crucified Jesus. Now, Jackie, I don't know about you, but I, my, my knees would be shaking a little bit, right? But you know what? He had this boldness. Where does boldness come from? It came from the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. He says, man, I'm going to preach. And he preaches them. And it says in verse 8 that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people, elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for the great deed done to this helpless man by what means he has been made well let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified oh boy there it is again who you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man stands here before you whole verse 11 of chapter 4 of Acts and this is a stone which was rejected by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by where men must be saved verse 13 I love this one and I'll, I'll let you go one more a couple verses and I'll let you go Verse 13, and when they, you're talking about the rulers here, Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and, and John, and Alexander, all the big wigs. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized what? That they had been with Jesus. Wow. These chuckleheads, they, they unlearned their, this guy's a fisherman for Pete's sakes. Where, where did he get this boldness at? Where, where did he get this authority from? I mean, they felt it, Daniel. They felt the power of God. Where did he get this from? Hey, they must have been with Jesus. That's right. You want power? You want authority? You ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit and spend time with Jesus. Spend time in his word. Spend time in prayer. And God will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And you know what? What did they do? They went back after they'd been threatened. They said, don't be speaking no more in this name. No. And they go back to the people who were assembled there. And uh, they said that they raised their voices to God with one accord, saying, Lord, you are God, verse 24, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, and who by the mouth of your servant David. And he goes on. Verse 20, so let's pick it up in verse 29 for, for sake of time. Verse 29, Acts chapter 4. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't that what got him in trouble? Isn't that what brought the ire of all the religious leaders that man was healed? What did they ask for? Come on, we want more of that. We want more of the power of God. That you would stretch out your hand, that signs and wonders would be done through the name of your Lord Jesus Christ. It's not by any individual. It's not somebody. We all look at the person and say, oh boy, they, they, they have this or that. Don't look at them. Look at the Holy Spirit of God. And verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Wait a minute. So they got breathed on. They get the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down again, and they're empowered. They're baptized, if you will, immersed with the Holy Spirit. And here again, they're filled again. Does it sound like we can have as much as we want? Does it sound like we can be filled over and over and over again as is necessary? When we call up and say, Lord, I'm getting a little dry over here, <laughs> getting a little dry. And all of a sudden, those, those metaphoric uh, uh, nuclear rods start coming out and we feel the power of God. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that if we want power and if we want boldness to witness, if we need strength to stand for righteousness in these last days, we need to spend time with Jesus and, and ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit because it's a gift. It, it's not something we earn or deserve or get to a point in our Christian life where we're so spiritually mature and now we get the Holy Spirit. No, no, nothing like that. It's a gift of God. Lord, we need it in these last days. So pour out your Spirit upon us, I pray, pray, Lord Jesus. And thank you that this church of Thessalonica, even in their affliction, they had the joy, the joy that came from the Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen. amen. God bless you. Okay. Thank you, Daniel.